Hello and welcome to our seventh and last episode of the Yield Pyramid. Let's go ahead and take a look at the pyramid and you can see that today in our last episode we're actually going to cover three blocks which are going to incl include the top two layers of our Yield Pyramid. And those include fungicide applications, boron and manganese, and then our very last block is foliar feeding. So let's go ahead and let's start with fungicides. Now fungicide use really picked up here about eight to ten years ago as we began to learn more about how fungicides work and maybe the additional benefits that we can see in our operations when we use fungicides. One of the things that people continue to maybe uh, incorrectly assume is that fungicides only benefit when we have diseases. And one of the things that we learned back in the drought of 2012 is fungicide applications are doing more than just managing disease. They actually can help the plant be more efficient uh, in things like lowering respiration or the rate at which it breathes. And also with under drought stress conditions, things like ethylene production. So fungicides are doing more than just disease control. And we need to think about that when we make our decisions of whether or whether or not we're going to use fungicides. So as we stated in an earlier episode, we should make that fungicide decision at the time of when we're selecting our corn and soybean varieties. And the reason why we do this is we want to decide pre-season if we're going to spray maybe none of our crop, half of our crop, or all of our crop. Because then when you are selecting your corn and soybean varieties, we can, we can help growers pinpoint which hybrids or varieties may respond better to fungicides than others. We do a lot of testing on every one of our uh, corn hybrids and know the likelihood of you getting a response. So when we do that at seed selection time, we can map out a very good plan and then work that plan as we move throughout the growing season. Now, the one thing that also comes about is when we try to make the decision for fungicide use in season, there's a couple things that happen. One is we go out and we try to determine, you know, is there diseases present currently in our crop? And one of the hard parts about going out around tassel time and looking to see if we're, we have disease is oftentimes most of our diseases take seven to ten days to actually show visual disease lesions after infections. So you could go out into your crop and scout it and take a look and tell yourself, well, there isn't any disease out here, so I'm not going to spray. And actually, you could have a, a large infestation or infection going on in your crop. It's just that you can't see it yet. So that kind of leads, leads you to, I don't know what the next 60 days of grain fill is going to be for weather, and it's very hard to make that decision at the time. The other thing that seems to kind of play in grower's mind all the time is late July when we're trying to make that decision, it seems like we're kind of in that cyclical part of the market where prices are starting to go down. And then we use emotion to help guide us. And oftentimes later on, we, we realize that, well, that was just a down part of the market. And when the market rallies the next spring, we don't have as many bushels to sell. So again, try to make that fungicide decision when we order our seed. Now some of the key learnings that we have learned here over the past years with doing a lot of research here in Northeast Iowa on fungicides. 105 day or 105 CRM and above hybrids, we stand an 80% chance of having a profitable yield response. So what that tells us is our full season corn is where we should really focus and think about maybe making that fungicide application every year. The other thing that our research data has showed us is the higher the yield environment, the higher the response to fungicide. And again, we know that full season hybrids typically are our highest yielding ones. So it kind of makes sense and it seems like year in, year out, those full season high yielding hybrids stand the best chance of making us money. The other thing that leads to us giving you a strong recommendation for late season or full season hybrids and a fungicide application is the fact that those are usually the one of the last ones you harvest. And we do know that fungicides definitely help improve late season standability, which can aid you in harvest 
and making sure that that crop is standing and we can get all the bushels that, that you produced. The next thing that we see is high residue situations, whether it's corn on corn or maybe no-till corn in the soybeans, is probably the next in line when it comes to allowing us to consistently have a profitable response to fungicides. So kind of keep that in mind as well. And even though we may be corn after soybeans, if we do have a lot of residue there, we can still see nice yield responses. Again, I mentioned with the full season corn, you know, factor in the value of late season standability and harvest speed. So that's another factor to consider. And a lot of people ask us about moisture. They say, Troy, you know, what does the fungicide application do to, you know, my dry down? And what we have found over the years is that when we are looking at 25 plus percent corn, so early harvest, you know, we're looking at one to probably two points wetter when you treat with a fungicide than, with, than if you would not have treated. Now, as that corn dries down and we get down maybe into that 22%, that moisture difference is generally around one point. And then once we get below 20% on our moisture of our corn, we generally don't see any difference between, uh, you know, areas that were sprayed versus not sprayed. So, you know, kind of factor that in on your cash flow. If you do harvest a lot of corn above 25%, you're probably going to need to, to factor in another one and a half to two points of dry down. If a lot of your corn is 22% or below, you really won't see much difference when it comes to moisture differences. Now, the other thing is, you know, in disease years, so if you've made the decision not to spray when you selected your corn hybrids with your Pioneer sales rep, and then we start to see diseases move in, and especially if we start to see those diseases pre-tassel, we have learned over the years that those are the years that we can see really large responses when it comes to fungicide applications. And the benefit that we have of being in Northeast Iowa is generally Southern Iowa and Southwest Iowa start to see this disease about two to three weeks before we do. So we like to stay in contact with our counterparts to the Southwest, and they can kind of give us an idea of what they're seeing and we can be better prepared. So if you do decide to do some trials on your own farm and we always encourage growers to, to do their own on-farm testing, be sure that you don't rely on just the yield monitor when it comes to evaluating the performance of the fungicide. You know, a lot of times looking at yield maps, one color on a yield map might represent a 10 to 15 bushel difference in yield. And therefore you might look at a yield map and say, yeah, I really don't, don't see much difference. So we need to get out there. We need to use that, that scale on the grain cart or call your local Pioneer sales rep and they can bring out the way wagon and then that way we can make sure that we get accurate data when it comes to determine whether or not the fungicide gave us a profitable response. All right, so now we're gonna go to the last block on this layer of our pyramid and that's gonna be boron and manganese. And the reason why we separate out these two micronutrients versus all the other micronutrients is these are the ones that we see most often on our tissue tests that are coming back deficient. Now that doesn't always necessarily mean if we apply these nutrients that we get a yield response, but these are the ones that we frequently see very often when we do tissue testing that are coming back low. So these are the ones after you've taken care of all the other blocks that we've previously discussed in the yield pyramid, these are the ones to take a look at. So let's go through these in a little bit more detail. Let's take a look at manganese. Now manganese is important for chlorophyll production, disease prevention, uh, the pollen that our corn sheds, and then really important for kernel weight and, and finishing out grain fill. Um, like most nutrients, it has low availability when the soil is cold. Um, soil test levels are not calibrated real well, but there are some studies showing that 20 to 40 part per million would be a good range to have on your soil test. And again, with most micronutrients, including manganese, you will probably have to make sure that your lab is running these micronutrients. So be sure to request that on your soil test if you're interested in managing manganese. The good part about manganese is that almost all of that nutrient remains in the corn stover. So if you are leaving your corn stalks out there or your soybean straw out there, 
you really won't be removing hardly any manganese from your system. So once you get your soil test levels built up to that 20 to 40 part per million range, you, you, should, be, you should be in good shape. And about two pounds per acre is taken up by most of our crops here in Northeast Iowa. So again, it doesn't take a lot to make sure that our crops are not deficient in manganese, but it's something that probably most people are not, not applying. So let's go ahead and let's move to boron. Boron, once again, is one of those nutrients that we are finding deficient quite commonly in our tissue testing. And boron is important for moving sugars, hormone balance, uh, important in our cell structures, and again, it's important in kernel fill. Now, the thing about boron is it is similar when it comes to leachability. So when you think about boron, kind of in the back of your mind, think it acts a lot like nitrogen and sulfur and the fact that if we do have high rainfall years, we do leach boron out of our system. So again, it's probably a product just like nitrogen and sulfur. If we are going to manage this nutrient, we probably need to apply it every year. The other thing that makes uh, boron hard to test for, especially on a soil test, is because it, it is leachable. Just like we had talked about, the sulfur soil test and the nitrogen soil test are very erratic and not very reliable because they are leachable. Now most crops only take up about three quarters of a pound of boron a year. So again, it is not something that we have to apply a lot of, um, but it is something that we should maybe think about applying nearly annually because it does leach. Now the one thing about boron, and you probably, if you've done any reading or talked to anybody about boron, is they say excessive applications of maybe over three to five pounds per acre can be toxic. So we really need to be careful on where we're placing our boron. We definitely do not want any in our seed furrow. So uh, any fertilizer that you're putting on, say with your planter in furrow, cannot have boron in it. However, I do know a lot of growers that are using boron in say like a two by two in their planter or using it as they're dribbling their fertilizer behind the closing wheels. Now most is taken up by the crop leaves in the corn grain and most stays in the soybean residue. So again, uh, we're not having a lot of crop removal, if you will, when it comes to boron. So if we don't have really excessive wet years, um, there will be some that sticks around. But again, it seems like with our rainfall patterns, it's probably a um, nutrient that you can think about adding annually or, or every couple years. Now the last thing I just want to show you is a boron uptake graph on 230 bushel corn. And you can see there's kind of two times where the plant is really aggressively needing boron. And that is kind of during that rapid growth phase that we get from you know, waist high corn to shortly before tassel. And then it's really important about shortly after we finish pollination as those uh, small kernels are developing and making sure that we're, we're not aborting kernels. And again, anytime that we talk about small amounts of nutrient application, whether it's manganese or boron, banding these nutrients near the corn root system is always the best way to go. And again, if you are using a two by two system on your planter, it seems like it could be a really good place to maximize efficiency when it comes to both boron and manganese applications. We'll now go to our final block in our pyramid and that's foliar feeding, whether it's any nutrient and especially micronutrients. And to be quite honest with you, there is not a lot of consistent, repeatable data showing that foliar feeding nutrients here in Northeast Iowa is, is profitable and gives us a consistent yield response. There's numerous growers that we've worked with, pioneers worked with universities, and it just seems like year in, year out, it's very difficult to, can, to get consistent responses. A couple things, if you do want to try some foliar feeding, I suggest that we probably want to think about doing tissue tests first to make sure that we know we have deficiencies before we start spending money to go out there and try to fix something. Um, now, again, focus on the micronutrients because on foliar feeding, we are applying a very small amount. And if you are short on a micronutrient, foliar feeding might be a good way to possibly get that nutrient to enter into the plant. 
Um, we do want to make sure though on some of these micronutrients that we apply small amounts because some of them can be toxic and the thing is is many of these micronutrient mixes are very expensive and especially when you think about what you're paying and how much actual nutrient you're getting for those dollars. So again, use those tissue tests to be sure that we're verifying there's a deficiency or you know, use them on a small amount of acres, run some test plots, some on-farm trials to make sure that you know, we're getting a response. It is profitable before we decide to do it across all the acres. Now the good news is, is there's many combo packages, if you will, that have multiple micronutrients or many of our micronutrients all in one jug. So that makes it very convenient to go ahead and, and make these applications and uh, kind of cover all your bases, if you will. But again, this is one of the very last things to, uh, to try and make sure that you have all the other blocks in your pyramid completed before you spend dollars on this. And again, do some on-farm testing. Uh, most of the research done here in Northeast Iowa is very inconsistent when it comes to you know, 250 to 300 bushel corn range. So I know a lot of the high yield guys talk a lot about foliar feeding. And I think that maybe when you get to those yield levels, it is important, but oftentimes here in Northeast Iowa in our 250 to, you know, 275 bushel range, we just don't see a lot of economic response when it comes to these fertilizer applications. Well, that concludes all of the yield pyramid episodes. If you have any questions, be sure to contact your local Pioneer sales representative. From all of us here at Pioneer, thank you for your business. Be safe, and we'll see you in the fields. That concludes this Pioneer Agronomy video podcast. Visit our page on pioneer.com and follow us on Twitter and Facebook for more agronomy insights.